continuing this morning with uh, stories of people that have had encounters with Jesus Christ and has changed their life completely. We're in the book of Mark, chapter 9, and we're going to talk about a guy here today that, that uh, had been tormented by a demon. Let me ask you a question here. Um, do you think that some sicknesses that people have are caused by demons? <laughs> Nobody wants to play. Huh? Nobody's going to answer that. <laughs> I love it. Uh, do you think that actually some demons could cause sicknesses in our lives? Uh, yeah, I believe they do. I believe they attack us in different ways. I believe that they attack Christians. I believe that they cause sicknesses in our life. They cause uh, injury. They cause whatever they can do because that's their job, right? To steal, kill, and destroy. And who they want to steal, kill, and destroy from? Us. If they already got the lost people, don't, they don't need to steal, kill them. They got them. They want to destroy us. They want to steal from us. They want to make our life miserable here upon this earth, uh, what little time we have. So that's basically their uh, their their calling, if you will, is what they're made to do. is to steal, kill, and destroy and make life miserable for believers and for all of mankind, bottom line. Uh, they literally hate us because God loves us. Amen? And, and we're the apple of his eye. All human creation is the apple of God's eye, and they, they hate that. And so they hate human beings altogether. So look in Mark chapter 9. We're going to look here at a story called The Tormented Boy. Uh, in chapter 9, starting in verse 14. Sorry about that. I'm having to use a different glass today. I can't see over the rim. It's huge. I don't never, never buy another pair like this. Anyway, good. Uh, look at Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. This is the longest account of this story is in Mark. It's also found in Matthew where he uh, sets the demon out of this tormented boy. But let's read it and see what happens here. Starting in verse 14. When they came to, to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him in the ground, throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him when the Spirit saw Jesus. Now notice that. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him in the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw a crowd coming and running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. Now, this is an interesting story. Mark has the most of this account written in his book. But notice what happens here at the very beginning. It, it kind of cuts into a story is what it sounds like when it says in verse 14, when they came to the other disciples. Who is they came to the other disciples? They're talking about Jesus, uh, James, John, and uh, Peter. They had just come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. They're not with the other nine disciples. They're coming into the crowd where those disciples are. So Jesus, Peter, James, and John have all been up on the mountaintop. Remember that story where, where Moses and, and Elijah appears with Jesus and, and Mo Peter's like, oh, let's build a church here, let's build a temple here. Let, you know, and all, he starts mouthing up and he says, be quiet, and this is my son. This is all I want you to worry about right here. You remember the Mount of Transfiguration thing. Well, that's where these guys are coming from. They're not at the scene yet. And they start arriving at the scene. So the other nine are trying to kick this demon out of this boy, and they're not having a good, good time with it. It's just not happening. There's three things I want us to understand from this story. Number one, sickness can be a spiritual attack. A sickness can be a spiritual attack, demonic attack. It can be that. Now, understand back in biblical day that the first train of thought was that if anybody had something horrible happen to them or if they had some kind of disease, it was a, 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 a judgment of God upon them because they got sin in their life. That's the first thing they thought of. But Jesus put the end to that thinking, didn't he? Not everybody that's got a sickness, not everybody that's got 
uh, something going wrong or a catastrophe in their life or things are falling apart in their life is because they got sin in their life. It could be a side attack, if you will, a blindsided attack from the enemy, Satan himself and his demons, coming in to destroy that life. So we have to be quick not to judge what's going on, but quick to discern, is this an evil thing or is this a you know, sickness thing? What's the, what's the cause of the sickness? What's going on? Because as I understand this right here, it can happen to anybody, not just lost people, but Christians too can be blindsided and even given a sickness or given a, a, something to deal with that's coming from not God. Let's put it that way, all right? That's coming from the, our enemy that is attacking us from, from whichever direction he wants to. But anyway, he's interfering with our life and causing a sickness upon us. We're going to find some other verses that help uh, support that thought that there was people in our, in our Bible that are recorded that were followers, even that were believers, but they had sickness problems. And they weren't sickness because they were being bad people. It was just the enemy attacking them. And, and, you know, how do you explain that? God lets it through his hand. God doesn't. How does that work? I'm not sure sometimes how all that works. All I know is that when it did happen, Jesus came and set them free. He came and set them free. He got the demon off of them somehow or some way for some reason. He let them free because Jesus just loves doing that kind of stuff, obviously. James 5 talks about being sickness. Sickness can be a spiritual attack, but not always. It can be a spiritual attack, but not always. So we can't just say all sicknesses is caused by this. All this is caused by that. It's not an all for fix for all of this. Understand, it is, it is two or three different ways these things can be happening. But it could be a sin issue, and it could be an attack issue from the enemy. So uh, as you are, what I'm getting at is as you pray for people who are sick, as you're praying for that sickness, don't throw out the fact that this could be an attack of the enemy rather than a biological issue wrong with the people. Understand it. You all, uh, work it from that area too. Work it from that range. If you're praying for somebody who's sick, to say I come against the enemy in this area because the enemy may be exactly what's causing that sickness. And so you're going to see it here in this story and a couple of more in just a minute. But James 5 says this in 14 and 16. He says, If there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sin, that's an important part, if he's committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In the middle of that verse, in the middle of those verses right there, when he says the prayer of the faith shall save the sick and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sin, that's no accident that that's there because, like I said, in this biblical day, some people thought that people's sins had caused their sicknesses. But in this verse right here, that word if changes all that. If they've committed sins, they'll be forgiven. They'll be healed when they come and they ask the elders to pray for them. That's an important thing because what it's telling me is sometimes these sicknesses are not because of sin. So when you're praying for somebody, and, and find out what the Lord, find what's going on, and then go to battle for them. Go to battle in your prayers for people. If is a big word. They'll be forgiven because they've come and humbled themselves in James chapter 5, and Christ will forgive them. Confess our sins in the very next verse to one another that we may be healed. In other words, deal with our sin issues so that we may be healed. Notice the thing about this boy here, though. He, it doesn't appear to have done anything. He's just being demonically attacked. And when it says boy, understand this in the Scripture, that's not a child like this. But notice what his father said. When Jesus saw him foaming at the mouth and, and having his fit there when the demon was messing, he says, how long has the boy been like this? And he said, what, since a child. So this boy that we're talking about could be 20-plus years old now. He's a, he's a grown man now, but he's still having these same problems. This demon's still controlling his life and throwing him in the fire and throwing him in the water and, and, and just making a miserable mess of his life. And so Jesus is saying, okay, well, you know, just wondering how long it's been con interfering with his life. How long has it been attacking him? doesn't say any reason of why it had a reason to attack him or what was the whole situation, but it was there. Bottom line, it was there. It was on him, been with him all of his life. And Jesus said, you know what, this, this is going to stop. It's been with him since he's been a child. This is about to stop right now. So he, he came against him. Another instance here that shows the same thing, a couple more examples. In Luke 13, verse 10, says this. As he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, <clears throat> behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together, bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up. When Jesus saw her, he called to her and said to her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So right there, he calls it out. We know there is a spirit of infirmity that comes and attacks us. 
attacked this woman for 18 years, had her bowed over where she couldn't straighten up. And he, and he come, he said, woman, you are loose from what? The spirit of infirmity. As a, as a demon, it was a, it was a spirit that was after her and, and, and causing her to be sick like this. And he kicks him out, and immediately she straightens up. She's made whole just like that. And it was all about a demon thing messing with her. Didn't give any reason as why she had it or anything, but that it was there. And it got, Jesus took care of it. Matthew 9, 32 and 33 says, As they went out, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil, and the devil was cast out, and the dumb or mute man spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It's never been like this in Israel. It was never so like this in Israel. In other words, a, deaf man, a mute man couldn't speak, had a demon holding his tongue, couldn't speak. And it was all about a demon rather than a sickness like we think of sicknesses. It was, a, it was a possession issue. It was a matter of a demon controlling his life. The mute man, he began to speak. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. He healed everybody that had demon possession. Everybody that came around him in that verse right there in Acts 10. He just took care of all of it. And it notice this, that Jesus, when he's taking care of demons, it's, a, it's one word, it's like, get out of there. And there's no arguing, there's no fight. <laughs> they get up and get out of there. Like when he went to the Gadaree and demonic, had legion, had thousands of demons in him. He didn't wrestle with that guy very long. He just said, I want y'all out of here. And they begged him not to send us into the abyss. Don't send us into hell, you know, send us somewhere else. And he said, take a pig. And he sent him out and they all jumped into pigs. And a thousand pigs went over the hill, cliff diving, you know. So it's like, understand they they spoke to him he spoke to them and they they obeyed his command because he's lord and savior jesus christ and that even the demons will argue with him because they know they know um in mark nine twenty two again in the verses we're looking at it says off times it casts him in the fire throws him in the water to destroy him but notice what the guy says if you can do anything we'd appreciate it have compassion on us and help us notice what this demon has done to this person notice what this spirit has done has destroyed him it, it's trying to kill him and, and to, to steal from him and kill him. It takes his joy away from him, his life. Uh, it's possible that this, this, obviously this sickness here was caused by a demon, no doubt about it. Uh, interesting thing about this is this, <clears throat> that when Jesus heals people of demon possession or heals people of their sicknesses, he never challenges their faith or condemns them for lack of faith. You ever notice that? Jesus didn't come down off the Mount of Transfigure. He didn't come down here with Peter, Paul, and James and walk out there and say, you know, this kid can't get healed because he don't have enough faith. But unfortunately, in the church today, I get this, this is what happens. Somebody lays their hand on somebody else to get healed. That person doesn't get healed. And because they're embarrassed, they say, well, you don't have enough faith. They throw the blame on the sick person. And I've never seen in the Bible yet where the blame's been thrown on the sick person. You know who it's thrown on? The people who are doing the praying. <laughs> Jesus came down off the mountain. He didn't go over there to the demonic control boy and say, well, you're just, you're just out of luck, dude. Can't help you because you don't have any faith. He looked and looked around and said, how long am I going to be with you people? Like that, talking to his other disciples. You, you unbelieving people, how long am I going to be with you? Your faith, is, and they pulled him off to the side later and said, Jesus, how come we couldn't kick him out? He said, you don't have any faith. You didn't have faith the grain of a mustard. See, if you had the faith the grain of a mustard, see, that thing would fly out of there. You could say the mountain, be moved, it'd be moved. He said, disciples, my boys, you don't have faith to know that you can do this stuff. And I can just see these guys. I'm, I'm putting my shoe in, in the sandals of the other nine guys there. I can just see them saying, now Jesus told us we could do this. Now, I know he's not here right now, but let's, let's do this. Let's try to kick, this guy wants help, let's try to kick this demon out. And they're trying and they're trying and, and all the time in their mind they're thinking, you know, Jesus can do it, but I'm not sure I can do it. I'm not sure, you understand where the faith comes from now? It's not in our ability, it's in his ability through us. But we still got to take that first step and say, okay, in faith I step out and I lay my hand on this sick person and ask for God to heal him. Our faith has to be that we make that move. It's not about the one, and I love that story where the guys bring that, uh, that crippled guy in and tear the roof off the house and lower him in. Who had the faith for that guy? The one they were lowering? He probably unconscious, he didn't know what was happening. They're lowering him into this house it's those people on the roof that have faith. If we get him in front of Jesus, we'll tear this house apart. We have to get him in front of Jesus, and I guarantee you, he'll heal him. Who's got the faith? The boys on the roof. Exactly. They got the faith. Jesus already got it. They know to lay him down there. The lady that touched the hem of his garment, who had the faith for her? If I could just touch his garment. He don't even have to speak a word to me. If I can just touch his clothes, I know I'll be. What she got faith in? The man in the clothes. Not his clothes, but the man in the clothes. 
And she's thinking to herself, if I can just touch him, he can heal me of this, right? And what happens? He does, doesn't he? Her faith is the, is the size of a mustard seed. She's been going through 12 years of bleeding and all these problems, and she just whips out and swoops that garment. And Jesus says, well, who, who touched my clothes? Somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. Peter's like, are you kidding? Yeah, somebody touched me. There's 20 people bumping up again. No, no, no. Somebody really touched me because they needed something. And he said, power flew from me. That lady had faith on her own with that, knowing who she was about to touch. But Jesus never condemned the people. Why do you think he didn't condemn them, the people that need healing for their faith? He never condemns the world because that's not what he was sent for. John 3, 17 says this, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's John 3, 17, right behind the verse that we all love the most, John 3, 16, right? And then he tells it, he didn't come in here to condemn this world. Why didn't he come to condemn the world? Because we're already condemned. He didn't need to come condemn us. He needed to come save us, right? We're already condemned. We're already condemned. And so that's what he did. He didn't come to condemn us. So if sickness can be a spiritual attack, then the second thing here is that sickness can be spiritually attacked. That's not a play on words. We can attack back, in other words. Sickness can be attacked back. But I'm, I hope you understand something now. Understand and hear from God that that's what's truly happening, all right? that that's what's truly happening with somebody that's sick and been fighting a sickness for years and years and years, that it is a spiritual attack, and there's a spiritual attack that needs to attack back, and we never, ever, ever attack the sick person. <laughs> you understand that? It's not about attacking them or making them feel condemned or guilty for where they are. It's about attacking the enemy who's sneaking in on the round side attack on them. That's the whole thing. That's warfare, folks. That's what we're in this for. That's what we've been called to do, is to pray for in that fashion with each other, especially for the sick and to pray for them that way and never never throw that out and say well it can't be a demon it can't be a spiritual issue it's got to be just sin issue or you know this is the way it is it can be it can be a demonic attack and you can't see it readily right off the bat so we can spiritually attack that matthew 17 19 through 21 said the disciples came to jesus set him apart and said why couldn't we cast him out and jesus told him just what i said a moment ago because of your unbelief but verily I say to you, if you have the faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, remove hence and yonder, and it shall be removed. Nothing shall be impossible to you. Howbeit this kind not goes out, but by prayer and fasting. Now that's interesting. This kind does not go out, but by prayer and fasting. They couldn't cast him out because of their unbelief. There's been a theological discussion about what Jesus meant about this kind. Did he mean <clears throat> this kind of spirit, this kind of long-term demonization? Or did he mean this kind of unbelief? Or did he mean this kind of faith? The answer is, doesn't matter which one you choose, the answer is still prayer and fasting. Now think about that. If it's about dealing with the demons, it's about dealing with your faith, it's about dealing with unbelief, it's all about prayer and fasting. That's, the, that's his pat answer for it, all of it. And, and I don't know about you, if you've ever done this before, you ever prayed and fast, had a fast over something and prayed over, that sort of thing. Uh, I've done this before. <laughs> Trust me, it is not fun. A uh, couple of good things here about prayer and fasting, though. If you fast without prayer, it's just a diet. You're just dieting, folks. That, you're going to lose a little weight. You're not eating food, obviously. But if you're fasting without prayer, you're just dieting. Because fasting is all about pulling back away from the world and pressing into God. Pulling away from the world and pressing into God. Now, when you fast, most of us will fast and just cut food off, you know, make, keep water going and stuff like that. We'll cut food off because we're bringing our body under submission. You ever, has everybody ever fasted in here before? If you haven't done it yet, let me tell you what happened. Let me give you a little <laughs> illustration of what happens with me, okay? Uh, first of all, you're going to go through that or the big old hunger pain thing. That stomach's going to let you know real quick, eat. You know, let's eat now. Let's eat now. And you fight that for a while. The next thing that's going to happen is if you're a coffee drinker, your caffeine is going to kick in and your headache is going to come, all right? Because that caffeine is screaming, feed me, feed me. It needs that fix. And coffee's like a fix. Yeah, that's right. It needs some coffee, it needs some caffeine, it needs some Coke, it needs some candy, it needs whatever to get the caffeine in the body. So the body's going to fight you there. You've got to bring it back into submission. You've got to hang on, hang on with the fast and bring it into submission. If you, you like sweets and sugar, that's the next thing that's going to kick you is the sugar habit. It's gonna, and he's a monster boy. He really wants some candy bad, you know. So that's going to kick and you're going to feel that. All the while, you're going to feel your body starting to have withdrawals, if you will, from what we eat daily in a fast. The point being, though, is that we fast so that we can press into God. 
If I'm fasting or if you're in a fast and you say, well, I'm going to skip the breakfast so I can go in another 30 minutes earlier to work. Or I'm skipping lunch, so I'm going to work through lunch and go home an hour early. That's not what a fast is about. It's not about that. It's when you, you, you normally stop and eat, you stop and you press into God. You stop and you read your scripture. You pray during that hour of your, when you're normally feeding your body, feeding yourself. And you press into God. You read, you study, you, you, you keep praying. It's all about praying and fasting, not just fasting by itself to lose weight. But there's the process of that, it becomes, becomes a, it's a, I can't say it, it becomes a real struggle, doesn't it, folks? Those of you who have done it, you understand what I'm saying? How that the body screams out to be fed and to be taken care of, and you start bringing the body into submission like that. But you know, when I first started uh, understanding what fasting was and praying was about, what it was for, I realized how hard it was, and I also learned something else. When the people that I, were, I was hanging with at that time, sometimes they would fast and they would pray trying to get God to do something for them. Understand this, fasting and praying is not so you can manipulate God, okay? You, you don't twist his arm with you and like, okay, God, I got you now. I fasted for three days. You got to answer this prayer. Ha, ha, forget that. He won't do it. Fasting and praying is not for him. It's for you. It's for you. And Jesus never said if you fast and pray, he said what? When you fast and pray, do this way. When you do, it was like it's not, a, it's not an option for us, is it? When you fast and pray, do this way. So understand, you're not twisting God's arm. You're not going to, we've already twisted his arms 2,000 something years ago when he put him out on the cross. We twisted his arm. And on that day, we all found favor with him. Amen? We all found favor with God. So you're not going to find any more favor with him fasting, saying, God, I'll do this if you'll give me this. You know, and I'll do three-day fast if you'll answer this or do that. Forget that, folks. It's not going to work. You pray and you fast for your set. It's for you. It's so that you can press into God and understand God's desire and his will for your life. You want to know it? Press in. You want to know his will? You want to know his desire for your life? Fast and press in. He'll give you the answer to that. He'll help you through some of those things. But we never fast trying to manipulate him or gain favor from him. It just teaches us that that's not what this lesson is teaching us here. It's teaching us that we need to be more uh, ready. The effort of faith is ours, not his. We need to pull, it, pull away from the world and push into God. You know, that's the interesting thing about We just got back from youth camp, wasn't it? Not long, just a couple weeks. Or a week, was that a week ago? <laughs> anyway, uh, the whole idea behind youth, and I've done a number of those youth camps years ago, and all, then the whole idea of that was to pull the kids away from the life that they were, uh, their families, their, their iPods, their whatever else it was back in that day, CD players and all that, get them away from the world system and put them in a system where they could press into God. And camp does the same thing. For then you all have never been on a youth camp thing. It pulls them away from the world system. It focuses them real hard on the, on the, the, the word of God. They have services every night. You know, it's, it's church every day, all day, every night. And it focuses them away from the things of the world and pushes them into God. It's almost like fasting and praying is what a youth camp is really like. And so they get, they get so focused on God, and God does something. In about two or three days, he'll change their hearts. It's amazing. Their hearts have changed, and then they come back to the real world, if you will. <laughs> they come back to the, where the rubber meets the road, and that little bit of change that's happened to them at camp, or a lot of change, whatever's happened, gives them another foot up on life as they work with the struggles that they come back home to. Some succeed greatly. Others don't. But at least for a moment, they were able to pull away and press in. And that's what, that's what camp does. That's kind of what fasting and praying does. You pull away from the things of the world. You press into God. And, and it benefits you. It doesn't manipulate God. So understand that for sure. So it's prayer and fasting. The third thing I want you to understand about this story is Jesus loves to give people their lives back. Have you ever noticed that? He loves giving them life. What's what he does this, with this kid. He gives him life. He, he, he not only does it with this kid here, he gives their life back. Remember the other folks we talked about, the, the, him, the him lady, the one who touched the garment of his, of his clothing. What does she have? Twelve years, was it? Eight years of bleeding and all, and then she instantly healed like that. What does he give her back? He gives her her whole life back. Now she can go back to synagogue. She can go back to worship. She can go act normal with everybody. She's not outcast and unclean. She's not any of that. What about the leper, right? He's a, he said, if, if you will, you can heal. And Jesus said, I'm willing. He heals him. What does he give him? His whole life back. He gets to now go out and back into the city, go to his family, to his grandkids, his children, gets to hug on them, and be, all of his life is given back to him. He gets to go back to synagogue, go to worship, 
You see, these people, they really wanted to go to church. It's not like today where people are like, you know, opt out. Is it cool today or is it hot today? Is it raining? I don't want to go to church today. No, they're not like that. In this day and time, they wanted to go to synagogue. Synagogue was their life. It was their life to be part of the church. It was their life to be at worship. It was everything they ever wanted to do. It was top priority. And when you get sick like this, you can't go. So the top priority of their life is snatched away from them because of these illnesses. So the leper, he gave him back his whole family, his grandkids, his kids, his wife, his, everything about his family. He gave him back his church, his worship time. He gave everything because he's no longer unclean. He gets to come back in society. Understand how this changed their lives. It was big time. Not only that, he gave the criminal on the cross his life back, even though it wasn't going to be but just a few more minutes long, didn't he? And what did he tell him? He said, today you're going to be with me where? Paradise, didn't he? He didn't say the bosom of Abraham or the place of the dead or a holding cell or a Hades. Or he said, you're going to be with me in paradise today. You're going to see it all. So he gave him his life, eternal life, right there on the cross, right before the guy died. He said, today you're going to be with me. This life is almost over for us, but in a few seconds, you're going to be right there with me. So he gave the criminal on the cross. Not only that, he gave this tormented boy his life, but this young man. He gave him his life. This kid couldn't go to the synagogue like he was. He might throw, have a throw-down fit right there in the, in the synagogue floor. He couldn't go into the worship service. Like he's unclean. He's unfit like this. Not only that, he can't go to his friends' parties. Think about that. As a young child, he's this been on him since he's been a child, his dad said. He hadn't been able to go to Rahid's party or anybody like that. He can't go to their birthday party. He can't go to anybody's stuff. He can't go in the synagogue. He's outcast. Other parents are like, mm, mm we're not inviting him over. He'll start foaming and throwing all over my floor. I ain't bringing him in the house. So this kid's been ostracized. This kid, this now 20-something-year-old guy, he understands rejection big time, doesn't he? And it ain't even his fault. It's not even his fault. It's not anything that he brought upon himself. It's the attack of the enemy on a child of God. Jesus said, Daddy, said, how long since he was a kid? He's been doing it. It sounds almost like an epileptic fit, doesn't it? The foaming and the rigidity and all this kind of stuff when he would go into his fits and all, and uh, all except for throwing him in the fire and everything. Understand, this kid doesn't look great. His skin's all burned. He's got scars. He's, you know what burns looks like? He's been thrown in the fire a number of times since he was a kid. He's probably got facial burns and back and arm rolling in his coals in the fire before his daddy could get to him, Jump, drowning in the water. All kinds of stuff happened to this kid because of this, that gump demon attacking a child. And this is guy comes up to him and says, you know, now notice what he says, though. This kid has known rejection all of his life, but notice what this guy, I love what Jesus did. He gave him his, his life back in verse 25. He says, when the deaf and, he said, thou deaf and dumb spirit, he's talking to the spirit, obviously, I charge thee, come out of him, and notice this, enter him no more, no more. When Jesus healed him, he healed him what? Complete, didn't he? You think that demon had access back in that kid's life? Absolutely not. Every time he tried to come back in, there's probably a war and angel standing there just flaming sword. Just come on. <laughs> come on, get close enough, I'll cut your wing off. You know, like I could just see that. That demon trying to come back to that kid later on, an angel of God standing there going, oh, I don't think so. I don't think so, buddy. You head on back to where you belong. And covered that kid for the rest of his life. Jesus delivered him and said, told that demon, said, you don't come back in him anymore, ever. You're done. And sent him away. He healed the kid, not just that moment, but for the rest of his life. Good news. Today, folks, Jesus wants to give us our life back, too. Anything is hindering us or holding us back or we've got attacks, we've got whatever's going on in our life, he also wants to say, you want your life back? Here you go. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. I've got this belief. I've got this belief, and it will happen for you. I have to ask, who's tormenting you? What's tormenting us? Our past, guilt, shame, unforgiveness, anything tormenting you today? Jesus will take it away from you. He'll give you life back today. Amen? He'll do it. It's not just for these guys here in the Bible. It's for us today, too. I notice in verse 22 and 23, notice what this daddy said now. He's answering Jesus about what happens. He said, oft times it comes, it casts him in the fire, throws him in the water, it destroy him. And he says, if you can do anything, Notice what the daddy asked. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said right back to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Jesus puts it back on him. You understand what the daddy asked? Jesus, I'm questioning your ability to do anything about this. Literally, 
He's telling, he's looking at Jesus saying, you know, if you have the power, if you're able to do this, you know, can you help us? And Jesus said, oh, it's not about me, it's about you. If you can believe, I can do anything. If you can believe, you'll see anything happen. Notice there was something, he questioned Jesus' ability. The leper questioned Jesus' what? Willingness, didn't he? What did he ask Jesus when he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can take this from me. And Jesus said, what? I'm willing. This father said, if you're able to do this, you can stop this from happening. Jesus said, oh, I'm more than able. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. So from those two stories, from the leper to this boy here, we can find out that Jesus is not only willing, he is able. Amen? That no matter what you're facing, no matter what your parents are facing, or whoever else you're dealing with and sickness and all that we're facing, all we've got to do is know that he is willing and he is able. And he will do for us what he did for these people in the first century church here, what he did for these people in day one, if you will, of the, after the cross here, and, and, and even before the cross. But he, he's, he's just saying our belief, so he pushes it back around on this guy to say, look, they, it's not about me and my capability. It's about whether or not you'll believe, Dad. Then this boy can be set free. So he puts the faith back on who? The daddy, doesn't he? Not the boy who's demon possessed. He never, can, he never points the faith back on the person who's sick. Not on the kid that's got the demon. He puts it on his daddy and says, you believe? Then watch what happens. Stand back and watch this. You know, <laughs> that's basically what he said. If you believe, stand back and watch this. We need to know that if, there's un if unbelief is attacking us, it attacks us in two ways. Number one, like these does these two. Number one, we're not sure God's able to or we're not sure God's willing to. Personally, for me, it's the willing deal. I know he's capable. I know he's able to do anything he wants to do. The question I always have at times, if I'm praying for somebody, God, are you willing to heal this person? That's the, that's the one that's always running through my mind. That's my unbelief issue right there. Exactly. And many of us face the same thing. God, are you, are you willing to? Because I know you can, but, you know, am I praying in your will? Are you willing to do this today and, and this miracle take place? And in, in both instances here, Jesus said, yeah, I'm capable and I'm willing. Here it is. That's the way it worked. And then in verse 24, it's straightway the father of the child cried out. He said with tears in his eyes, he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Any of y'all ever been in that situation before? <laughs> yeah, me too. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I know you can. I know you will. But I've still got this doubt in my mind that you're going to do it right now. Right? Help my unbelief, Lord. Even for something that's down the road. Help my unbelief, Lord. I do believe. I know you can do it. Help my unbelief. And in Matthew, in Matthew, the same story here, Matthew, Jesus tells the Father, he says, bring him to me. Bring him to me. That's important. <clears throat> Jesus could have walked over to where he was. But the importance of that, of bring him to me, is this. In 2016, you got somebody that needs Christ. You got somebody that needs healing. You got somebody that needs Jesus in some way or another. Bring him to Jesus. Bring him to him. How do you bring him to him? You lift him up in prayer. You introduce them to Jesus, who Jesus is. You bring them to, the, to the, the healing of Jesus. You bring them to him. Because Jesus told that father, he said, you know, just, just leave him right there. I'll walk over to him. No, he says, bring him up here to me. And put him at my hand, at my feet. And then see what happens. So that's encouragement for us. I don't know about you. Because we've got a, a child, a grandchild, a husband, wife, anything like that that we, that we need to bring to Jesus. That's all he's saying is bring him here. Bring him here and I'll heal him. Bring him here I'll take care of it. Bring them here. I get rid of that demon problem. Get, bring them here. Bring them to me. Bring them to me. And so we have that assurance that if we keep bringing them to Jesus through prayer, he's not only willing, but he's able to help also. I've heard testimony time after time of someone saying, I've prayed for that boy since he was little, and that boy is now like 40-something years old, and, and they prayed for him, and then at 41 years old, they got saved. You know, I prayed all those years. It'd be a mom or whatever. Saying, I prayed for that boy. I prayed for that boy. He went through up and down time, rough times. And then finally, he met Jesus at age 41. Been praying for him since he was five years old or what. God save him. God save him. God then kept, kept praying, kept push, pressing in and pushing in. And finally, at 41, the kid gives his life to Christ. The kid, the, the adult gives his life to Christ. Can you imagine what this father was like here? He'd probably been seeing this since this, cow, this kid was a child. He's done everything he can do to try to help this child out, take him to all the kind of doctors, everything like that. Probably even prayed for him in certain ways and nothing, 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 nothing for all those years. This kid's probably been tormented 18, 20-something years. You, you, never, you don't know how old it start, when he started. And the father's just had enough, and he says, I know Jesus has done this before. I've heard of the stories about it. I'm going to bring him to him and say, if you're capable of doing this, do this for my child too. 
And Jesus didn't turn him away, did he? Jesus didn't turn him away. He said, yeah, here you go. Just believe. Watch this. Boom. And he exercised. He took that demon out of that boy, out of that young man, at that very moment with just the spoken word and told him to come out and don't you ever come back in. And I can tell you right now, we'll probably see that young man one day. And he'll say, that was me. I made the Bible. I'm in there. <laughs> that was me. And he rescued me. And he'll give us that testimony. He'll tell us what happened that day. Uh, uh, even a more in-depth study of it than what Bart did. But that's, that's amazing how God did this. It's amazing that what we read about in this scripture right here it still happens in 2016. It still happens today. You may not see it every day in your church or what. It still happens in the family of God. People are getting set free every day because they believe they fast, they pray, they believe, and God does things. God does miraculous things in their life. All to Jesus I surrender.